started out as a sweet pumpkin, <laughs> so what went wrong? Stop it! Karen Bourne saves lives, dog lives, over 300 in the last three years alone. And the plight of the fat cat. It's all coming up on Animal Attractions. Hi, I'm Alex Boylan, and this here is Huck, and welcome to this episode of Animal Attractions, the show about the deep affection people have for their pets. Today, we're going to visit the Weber family, whose Doberman Pinscher has gone from sweet little puppy to scary attack dog. And imagine fostering over 300 dogs and finding a home for each and every one of them. It truly is an amazing story, and you're not going to want to miss it. But first, here's co-host Megan Blake to help you find the best pet. Lions and Conyers and Coneheads may not be your typical house pets. Most of us like to stick with the usual suspects, like dogs and cats, like Toot Sweet here. After all, they've been entwined into our social structure for a few thousand years. Dogs help men hunt, fight off wild beasts, and warn them of intruders. And cats kept the mice away, and in some places were even revered as deities. Eventually, they became our companions and pets. But just because they have a long history with us doesn't mean you can't stray a little and explore other pet options that might be even better for you. The secret is to pick the pet that matches your expectation and lifestyle. That way you'll create the perfect match that can last a lifetime. How do you do that? Knowledge is power. First, get clear on what you want in a pet and how much time and space you have to devote to him. Do you want one to cuddle and play with? Do you want to be entertained by a funny character? Or do you just want to sit back and enjoy watching nature? Remember, what's just plain creepy to one person is very intriguing to another. After you've identified what you're attracted to, next comes the reality check. What does it take to keep that pet happy and healthy? And then the million dollar question, what is your perfect match? If you're looking for a very unusual, extremely limber, cuddly creature that can be trained to use a litter box and walk on a leash, you might want to meet the ferrets. These mammals are so flexible that it's said they can actually turn around in their own skin. The downside to these little creatures is that the babies can be nippy and the adults have a pungent, musky smell, as does their litter box. For quiet and cuddly, you might consider rabbits for a household made up of adults and older children. They aren't a good choice for younger children because their powerful hind legs make them difficult to hold and they can kick and scratch. Their spines are also delicate, so they need to be handled gently. If younger children are in the household, you might like the guinea pig. When socialized, they don't kick or scratch like a rabbit might. They love to be cuddled and brushed, and they whistle and purr when scratched behind the ears. Hamsters also live indoors in a cage and are smaller than guinea pigs, but their little size doesn't mean that they're easier pets. They're not quite as friendly and have to be handled daily to keep them socialized. They're also nocturnal, and if you want to interact with them during the day, you have to wake them up slowly or you might startle them and get nipped. Now, if you love the sound of birds chirping and talking, parakeets, cockatiels, or the sun conure have a good track record as pets. All are good talkers and mimic easily. The cockatiel and sun conure are bigger and generally have a nicer temperament, but all can become affectionate pets that like to perch on their people. Birds are also extremely sensitive to air quality. So it's important to know that the use of air fresheners, scented candles, cigarettes, or aerosol sprays could actually kill them. What about reptiles? These are cold-blooded animals, which means that you will be responsible for making sure their body temperature stays regulated by providing them with a heat source or UV light appropriate for that species. If you want to just sit back and enjoy the view, you might want to invest in some fish. You can choose from freshwater to brackish to saltwater fish and can go from a little bowl to a giant aquarium to an outdoor koi pond. Generally, saltwater fish are more colorful and flamboyant, 
but those tanks are more difficult to maintain and that in addition to cleaning the water, the salt level must be kept constant. In selecting your perfect pet, knowledge is more than half the battle. You don't want to get a beautiful bird to find out that he's just too noisy, or a cute ferret to be surprised by his unusual aroma. And in collecting all this pet information, you might find out something interesting about yourself. Do you like your environment quiet and relaxing, or do you like a little chatter in the background? Are you an observer or a cuddler? Whatever you are, if you love animals, and you're willing to take the responsibility to care for a pet, chances are the perfect one is out there just for you. John Weber wanted a protective pet, but instead, he got Mickey. <laughs> I'm just concerned about uh, security with all my kids and my wife and everything, so uh, we thought um, a Doberman would be a good pick. What surprised me the most about Mickey is his uh, aggressive behavior. Uh, he, yes, he is a guard dog, but we want to be able to live with him also. And at this point, we just feel that's not even possible. My neighbors have a dog, and he runs back and forth along the fence. And I've had to go buy uh, all kinds of sod and dirt to replace all that. I'm a stay-at-home mom, and I have four young children. The youngest is seven weeks. And the thing that frustrates me the most about Mickey is that his barking just drives us nuts. <laughs> He wakes the baby up constantly. People are definitely afraid of him because as soon as I, the door cracks open, you see this Doberman head trying to get at them. He's a big dog. He's a lot of muscle and he's very intimidating. And even people that we have come over are scared to death of him. And I'm very nervous about having him around a little infant because he's a dog and I don't really trust him. When we go for walks with Mickey, um, I find that I've had a lot of tremendous amount of trouble just controlling him and I'm using all my strength to hold him back and for my children to do it is just unreasonable. When I was uh, nine months pregnant, I was three weeks from my due date and I was trying to take him for a walk just in front of our house and he saw another dog and took off and I went flying. Airborne, landed and just was all scraped up and bruised for a week. At that point, I mean, we were really like, we gotta get rid of this dog, it's, it's just too destructive and it's not gonna work out. But it just didn't seem right to us and so we decided that we would uh, get a trainer and we would work it out with him because he was part of our family. Education is very, very important that you establish that from the beginning, rules and regulations when you first bring the dog home versus just setting it free and then chasing the dog all around the house for the next several months or for the entire relationship that you and the dog have simply because you think that you just brought in a human being that's going to understand what you, your needs are. We also needed to be trained and it took an effort on our part. We thought it was all the dog's fault. Keeping it connected to you as a puppy when you first bring it in the house and start showing it rules and regulations, A, it learns a lot faster, that it cannot get away with this and get away with that. If we can correct the dog in the first 15 seconds of whatever crime it commits, there's a connection for the correction. Hey, Mickey, no! What did you do? No, that was bad. Also, the puppy does not grow up seeing us as the bad guy running after them every single time that they're doing something that they really don't understand that is wrong. Hi. 
Hi, I'm George, one great dog. When George came to visit us for the first time, we saw an immediate change in Mickey's behavior. Right now, I see that you're holding him back a bit. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Is it always like that? You have two hands Pretty much him for the most all part. wrapped up like that? Yeah, I've been, uh, And yeah. do you do it the same way? Yes. But well, that's the first thing we need to start changing is okay. the way, because right now, he can feel that you're there. So okay. why even bother looking for you and so on? That's why you see him just focusing out on other things and so on. The first time he took Mickey, he, he explained Really, it's probably, it's more of us that need the training. Well, that barking towards people and so, he's maybe protecting you guys. Hey, they're, they're too weak, let me take over. So we want to start basically by uh, making ourselves a little bit more important to the dog, okay? And with walking the dog, uh, basically we're walking him, now we're the leader and he's the follower. Versus this way, it looks like he's walking you most of the time. Yeah, that's probably right. true. Yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Right. That's right. Okay. And he walked the dog. Mickey, come. And immediately he was responsive, and we were like, is this even our animal, you know, our, our pet? And um, I was really impressed. Right there, I go the opposite way. So all of a sudden, right there, he paid a little price for making that squirrel or whatever else he's looking at over there a little bit more important than me. So as I keep talking to you, I'm just going to show him that he needs to focus a little bit on me. We taught the dog to be respectful for the simple things as far as simple commands, sit, sit, stay. Uh, down, down, stay, start building leadership with that. You see right now, what he's doing, he's trying to dictate to me on what to do. Oh, okay. okay, you see, no, I'm going over there, no. So what I do is I'm moving away, and I'm just gonna bring him even closer. Okay. okay. So we started with John learning how to hold the leash the proper way. George first demonstrates using one of his own dogs to show the owners what is possible. Okay, so we wanna start by holding the leash, even though he's wanting to pull, okay, it should always be nice and loose. My left hand would be the correction hand only. Okay, not this way, like this, because this way the correction's not getting to the dog. So we always start with the left leg and we'll stay consistent with that. So if we start with the left leg and the dog's on my left side, he's gonna move immediately with me as I move. So he really showed me how to take the leash and to use to speak to the dog through the leash. So correction's never from the right hand, is always with the left, you would grab it this way and just give it a pop. Not pull to hold the dog back, but little bites. Just the same way he would bite, like a Doberman. The leash is not just to hold the dog back, but to show it and dictate to it. What goes down the leash is what's gonna Turn. come up the leash. Keep going. Too late. Turn to your right. Keep walking. And adjust yourself. You never stop. You're giving him, you see how you gave him all that leash? With all dogs, Either you're a follower or you're a leader. The dog is looking for directions from us. My dog used to be basically the same way, okay, but he has leadership right now, so that shouldn't bother him. When George first came, I really had given up hope with Mickey. I was convinced that we were probably going to have to get rid of him, uh, even though I hated to do that. But uh, after a few sessions with George, even after the first one, I saw uh, the light of hope. Okay, so this is your homework assignment for the week, and we're just basically going to practice a uh, uh, pecking order all through the leash control the way I showed you today. You're going to write down your 10, 15 minutes of workout, each one of you guys, okay? okay. And you're going to grade the dog A, B, or C. This gives us a chance to see that every day he's getting a little bit better or a little worse. Okay. And it also gives me a chance to see who I need to work on more. Is it the dog or is it the owners? Okay. Okay? Once we make ourselves the leader of the pack, you're going to have a more calm, collective dog because he sees you as the leader, letting you make the decisions under any condition, whether you're at home, in your backyard, or out in public. With a Doberman, it's, you know, I have to go up the stairs first. He can't eat with us. He's the bottom of the pack. I have to make sure that's happening. Leader always eats first. We never like to see the dog eat and then you eat. That automatically makes the dog at a higher level. Feed the family first, then let the dog be the last one to eat. Automatically in the dog's mind, he's thinking, well, I must be the bottom of the pack. And he'll be very happy. There were simple things that we had to do just as getting the right collar for him and uh, showing that we're the ones in charge, we're the alpha and beta, and he is beneath us. Then you would apply the walk and the sit and stay to now the door manners. Where the dog is not running towards the door when it hears the doorbell ring, but waits for you so that it can walk by you. We placed a small mat so that Mickey can have a visual indication of where to stop and automatically sit. 
So when we say something, we follow through with a correction. A correction can be simply just saying no. I'm just say no and, and a few nope. corrections. Nope. Which is our growl word for everything and anything that the dog does wrong. Not one person saying no, the other one stop it, the other one sit, the other one running away. Once he realizes his place within the family, that he is um, beneath even the smallest child, a baby, he's much happier in that situation and that the aggression seems to go away just because uh, I think he knows his place more. So how's it going today? Good, very good. Good, good. I noticed, yeah. that, I noticed that he didn't bark at the door or anything. It has been so much better. It's been a great improvement. He's been super around the baby. The baby's not screaming half the day because the dog's barking at everything. I feel like we've learned uh, how to use the leash and how to speak the language of um, an alpha dog that's trying to dominate us, but you know, I feel like he's part of the pack now. At the end, I was very happy with the result. Uh, number one, Mickey got to keep his home his family, which he really, really loved, and that was all that Mickey really wanted to do is be with his family. He just didn't know how to go about doing it. I'm so happy we decided to stick with it because Mickey's been such an asset, and he's such a friend to the family, and he's just, he's like another family member now, and we are, we're just enjoying him. As cat owners, we love our cats. But sometimes we can love our cats just a little too much because we like to make our cats happy by giving them treats and feeding them their favorite foods. Sometimes our love can actually lead to cats being overweight. It's important as a cat gets older that we adjust the diet appropriately to suit the cat's age and activity level. Just like for us, as we slow down with time, we also need to adjust the amount of calories, the amount of protein that we give our cats on a daily basis. It is important to prevent weight gain in cats, so it's key to work with your veterinarian and make sure that what we're giving them every day is ap appropriate. We typically recommend that cats exercise about 20 minutes, about three times a week. We can do this by playing with them. Also, some cats like to be walked. So there's a number of different ways that your veterinarian can suggest that you increase the activity level of your cat. Most cat owners don't realize that about one third of cats are actually overweight. The key to that is prevention. Typically, like Poco here, what we start to notice is we lose our waistline. So that long, sleek um, figure we used to have actually starts to go away as we gain a little bit too much weight. Some cats, as they gain weight, can actually develop a little bit of a paunch here in the uh, abdomen area. This too is a sign that maybe it's time for us to talk to our veterinarian about proper nutrition for our mature cat who has gained a little bit more weight than we should. So to ensure your cat has a long and healthy life, work with your veterinarian to ensure that your cat maintains a normal healthy weight. Dogs come in all shapes and sizes, but here's a little breed that even though he may be small in stature, the term Braveheart fits him to a T. Yes. For a breed that's been so closely associated with Mexican tacos, it might surprise you to learn that the Chihuahua may have originated in Egypt or China or Spain or Cuba. No one knows for sure, but what's undisputed is that this is the smallest of all dog breeds. Well, small in size anyway. When it comes to energy and personality, the Chihuahua is a dynamo. I don't think the Chihuahuas are aware of their size. She goes outside and bigger dogs come up and she goes right up to them. Uh, very brave dog, loving, sweet. A lot of fun. Very inquisitive. Smart dogs. Very playful. Pretty outgoing. Likes to go with you, likes to be with people. Pretty good dog. In this breed, you'll find their long coats, which are, the hair must be very soft and a very smooth with a fluffy tail and fluff around their ears and a ruff on their neck. 
Now the smooth coated are real slick with less hair, come on baby, less hair on their heads than um, on their bodies. They're very good for apartments because they take up very little space. But they're not destructive like a lot of dogs. They don't uh, chew on personal belongings or furniture or, or anything along those lines. They love a lot of hands-on touching. They love to sit in your lap and they love a lot of affection. You know, she'll sit there and look at you and listen to you and, uh, you know, want to be playful with you and don't you? Yeah. Well, the precautions with the Chihuahua is being very careful because of their size. And they're delicate little dogs. Their little legs are very tiny and they will break very easily. I do not recommend Chihuahuas for very small children. With Chihuahua puppies, if you are interested in getting a, a Chihuahua puppy, I think you'd want to check and make sure that the ears are clean, make sure there's not any wax or any debris down in the ears, make sure the eye is nice and shiny and that there's no matter in the eye. I would check and make sure that the coat is nice and shiny, make sure that there's no parasites or fleas on the puppy. Uh, I think if all these things are in order, then chances are you're going to get a healthy puppy. Although chihuahuas are relatively easy to housebreak, their small bladders mean they'll have to eliminate more frequently than other dogs. And don't worry about the shivering. Chihuahuas aren't always cold or nervous. They have a very high metabolism, and this is simply a way they visually express it. For many people, especially apartment dwellers, a chihuahua is the perfect companion animal. Loyal, devoted, protective, and portable. Have you ever considered being a foster parent for lost and abandoned pets? Karen and Rob Bourne did. Over the past three years, they have fostered over 300 dogs. And on top of that, they have found each and every one of them a permanent home. Meet the Bournes. They look normal enough, but take a closer look, and you'll see that they're not your average couple. It's not the custom motorcycles Rob builds out of the Volkswagen Bugs. Nor it's the fact that Karen puts up with Rob building bikes. Nope, it's the fact that they've saved over 300 lives in the last three years just by being foster parents to dogs. Everything got started back when uh, Karen was fostering for the uh, Humane Society. Uh, she got together with uh, some of the other volunteers over there and uh, they decided to start their own organization. STARS stands for Save the Animal Rescue Society. It's just a, a name that we thought would be catchy and cute and just get us out in the public eye. The first dog I brought home, I ended up keeping and, the, and uh, that's how we lose all the fosters because they fall in love with the dog and they keep it. When, when, when she first started bringing these dogs home, I thought she had lost her mind. She was, uh, uh, we already had uh, a few dogs of our own. <laughs> Luckily for me, my husband's an animal lover and, and uh, he liked all the dogs. Uh, we started finding homes for the dogs and it got to be interesting. Well, I think that Karen's deep, deep passion is basically what fuels this organization. When I bring a dog home from the shelter, I bring it in the house and I let them in one at a time to get to meet each other. But my husband's strategy is to let them in the backyard and they all meet at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What makes Star so special, we feel, is the fact that the dogs aren't in shelters. They aren't in cages. Hey guys, look what I've got. Sometimes you'll have a dog that absolutely acts horrendous in a cage, and no one will look at it. But once you take it out, it's in your arms, it's kissing, it's loving, it's happy. But people don't see it if the dog's in a cage. But when they come to our homes and see the dog jumping around and happy and kissing and loving, then they want to take him. His name is Dandy, and he is just the sweetest little boy. Though. He gets a beauty program, and his nails cut, and his shampoo, and uh, his hair done. And, and sometimes they have to go to the groomer and be shaved down because they're um, matted. And, they were running for a long time, nobody took care of them. <laughs> well, the process starts with, uh, uh, we'll either go to the shelter and pick up a dog, or Pat will come over here and, uh, and bring us a dog, and we'll, uh, we'll uh, take him and set him up, take a few pictures of him. He is the picture taker supreme. Come on, Louie. Okay. 
He needs to quit his day job and just take dog pictures. They're gorgeous. That's what gets people to pay attention to them. That's what gets people to take our dogs over somebody else's dogs. Everybody thinks I'm a good photographer, but it's just because if you take 30 pictures, you're bound to get a couple of good ones in the bunch. And uh, we, uh, uh, I crop them and size them and get them all ready for it to go up on the website. When we get an option application, we screen, we call the vet and make sure that their animals are up to date on their shots and their heartworm. And we don't opt it out to anybody for breeding, and we don't, our animals are spayed neutered before they leave, and we'd like to make sure their animals are spayed neutered also. And we'd like to adopt our animals to be an indoor pet. No animal wants to be chained up outside all day. Have a seat. We've got some paperwork we've got to do. We'll uh, uh, check them out and find out if we think they'll be good pet owners. Uh, some pets uh, get hundreds of applications. Some pets get two or three. I initial all these little boxes. This is uh, uh, where it says he's been spayed and neutered. If they're little and cute, their picture doesn't even get up. They don't have time to get up on the internet. They're adopted from word of mouth. And the bigger the dog, the older the dog, the longer it takes. Karen and Rob both do the fostering, and basically I have to give Karen a little more credit because she's the one that's home all day cleaning up after them. But without them, there wouldn't be a start. Since we started, uh, Stars has found homes for over 400 dogs, and probably 300 of them have come through our house. <laughs> Karen, Karen spends a lot of time doing this. I think she uh, she would like to save every dog out there. She uh, probably spends 60 hours a week doing this, uh, just shopping for the for the food for the dogs and uh, all the supplies. And every time we uh, we have someone adopt one, I come back the next day. It seems like there's two more. Being a foster parent is the most bittersweet experience you'll ever have. Here's your new dog. Part of your heart leaves every time one of your puppies go. And if you're a selfish person, you cannot be a foster parent. Bye, Marilyn. Bye. I feel happy that we got them a home, and the sad part is there's always another one. So I'm never done. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Animal Attractions. If there's anything you've seen today that you'd like more information on, you can look us up at www.animalattractionstv.com. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.